we're going to read through Dr. Fei Fei Li's thesis. Apologies in advance for any noise outside. There's construction across the street and it's been going on all day. So I gave up on finding a quiet time to film. So here we are. For those who don't know, Dr. Fei Fei Li is a Stanford professor. She is the co-creator of ImageNet. I've done videos on her in the past, so you can check that out up here. She is a leading researcher in the computer vision world, and she did her PhD at Caltech in 2005 when she defended, which is when I was nine. <laughs> if you're new to my channel, I'm Jordan, and I'm a PhD student at MIT who works on neurotech and AI, so consider subscribing if that sounds interesting to you, and otherwise, let's get into it. So the title of her thesis is Visual Recognition, Computational Models, and Human Psychophysics. And this was interesting to me for a lot of reasons. One of them because I didn't realize until doing this video that her PhD is actually in electrical engineering, not in computer science. So that was cool. I almost did my PhD in ED uh, before doing in medical engineering. So to give a little bit of context, this is a PhD that was defended in 2005, which means she probably started around 2000, which means she got to experience Y2K <laughs> during her PhD. I'm sure that was interesting. But it also means that as the exponential growth of computer vision and AI more broadly has continued, especially recently, one of the reasons why I find these types of videos to be super fun for me to do and, and these types of projects to be super interesting is that the field was just in a completely different place at this time. So the introduction to her thesis focuses on object and scene recognition and how humans do it and then how we can design algorithmic systems that can do the same thing, how we can classify different aspects of an image or a video using computer vision. Oh, one of the things that's kind of interesting here is that it gets a little bit into like natural adversarial images, which I think I did a video on in the past. If I haven't, I'll make a short about it. But essentially the idea that there are some images that we come across in nature that we mischaracterize, that we mislabel and that just happens and they end up being really interesting data set for people in computer vision but also people in like psychology and like people who work with like the visual region of the brain to understand why it is that our brains have so much trouble identifying these particular types of images and what we can do to potentially make it easier or design models that can do that more easily than we can. I think another thing that's interesting in her introduction is that a lot of this focuses, especially in early computer vision, so a lot of early computer vision is interested in the intersection of computer vision from an algorithmic perspective and computer vision or really vision and the visual cortex from a human neuroscience perspective. And so we learned about the visual system in my neuroscience class. It's very complicated. <laughs> Um, and it, it does provide an interesting question that I feel like came up for me in this, which is like why we should be using algorithms, neural networks specifically, but algorithms more broadly to model the visual cortex at all. I don't know. It, it's just, it's something that I've started to question a lot more, just decisions that were made to follow particular paths in this field. And so I'm not putting down those paths. I think that people did what they could with the information that they had. I just think that it would have been really interesting to see people maybe contradict this particular approach and look at other approaches of doing this because evolution isn't something that happens all in one specific way. There is convergent evolution where things evolve in a very similar way, but I just would have been interested in, in other approaches that would have resulted in comparable or better vision performance on tasks. So part two, so the first real part of her thesis is natural scene categorization and the near absence of attention. We've heard a lot about attention in the transformer natural language processing GPT-3 space. So it'll be interesting to see what comes up here. It looks like essentially what she finds in the study is that there are little or no attentional cost in rapid visual categorization of complex natural images. So detecting the presence of an animal, vehicle, or a natural photograph, a genuinely challenging task for today's computer vision algorithms can be carried out by human observers in the near absence of attention. So that's pretty interesting. I mean, it's not super surprising, but it is interesting just to know that people can 
identify these things fairly quickly compared to the algorithms that we had in 20, 2005. And I'd be curious as to whether or not that gap has narrowed in the last 17 years. <laughs> She recruited subjects, oh god, 15 highly motivated Caltech undergrad and grad students between 20 and 26 years old. As someone who just switched into like clinical work and human subjects works, 15 is a really small sample size that isn't to put down her work at all. A, I don't know from like a statistical power analysis perspective, like how many samples she really needed to do this project and have statistically significant results, but also I don't know how many people she had available to her in order to complete this thesis because as many people have told me and as I repeat to myself on a day-to-day -day basis, the best PhD is a finished one. So that is a very small sample size. You end up having some selection bias because it's a bunch of Caltech undergrads and grad students, but yeah, I just find that a little bit funny. <laughs> As someone who is dealing with the, the challenge of recruiting participants for studies and making sure, or trying your very best to make sure that it is a diverse group of people who represent the problem that you were trying to solve. So here's the experimental paradigm that she was looking to do. So we're looking to have, if anyone's ever taken, um, I feel like an impact test, the thing that you take as a baseline for a concussion in high school if you did sports is the best example, but they have like the cross in the middle and then you have to like look at things that are happening outside the cross and like identify them. This is similar to that. And so we're looking at both central vision then what happens in your peripheral vision. All trial types are presented with equal probability and then subjects are instructed to respond by pressing S, S on a keyboard or D if one of the letters differ from the other four. Okay. One of the things I wanted to check was whether or not S and D were close to each other on a keyboard because that also creates issues or can create issues. I'll have another video coming up where I talk about <laughs> the challenges associated with that kind of stuff that I experienced in um, a, a study or a test that I took recently, but S and D are next to each other, so that's good. And then it looks like the central task performance under the dual task condition showed no difference from its counterpart under the single task condition. So people were focused on the center of that image, focused on that cross at the center and weren't necessarily focused on the peripheral images, as opposed to what you might expect, which is if you see something in the periphery, you would be more focused on that. There have been a lot of studies that have shown that that wouldn't necessarily happen. I feel like the one that comes up most frequently for me is the one where um it's the one where you're supposed to count how many goals there were in a soccer game but there's a bunch of people in like bear costumes in the background and you don't notice it at all because you're so focused on the soccer ball so that's not super surprising from an attention standpoint but it is interesting to see it here another thing that i was curious about which she does talk about in this paper is essentially whether or not performance on this task was about things that were in the foreground, things are in the front, things that you'd pay attention to first are easier to identify than things in the background. And so that's something that she actually talks about here. So this result suggests that categorization of natural scenes in the near absence of attention might well be a general phenomenon not limited to evolutionarily relevant object categories. An additional confound is that the subjects may not be performing an animal or vehicle detection task, but might be detecting the presence of a foreground object However, the fact that animal photographs are used as distractors for the vehicle task and vice versa makes this possibility impossible since foreground objects were contained in both the target and distractor images. So in short, it looks like they tested both foreground and background images in terms of attention and there wasn't a ton of difference between the two, which is super interesting because you would think that things in the foreground are things that you would pay a lot more attention to as a user. I'll also note here, I don't for these videos at least, plan to go through the entire thesis. These things are usually like nine chapters. If you'd like to see that as a like a Nebula Plus video, I'm happy to do it. It just doesn't feel like something that would necessarily be like super interesting <laughs> to most people. So that's why I don't do it. Chapter three is an interesting one, just in terms of whether or not people were neurodivergent in terms of attention. As someone who has ADHD, I know that actually relevant to another video that I'm in prep for, paying attention to things like this can be very, very hard and your attention can fall off over time. So I'd be curious as to whether or not there was anyone neurodivergent in the study, but that's not really recorded here. So 
that's kind of an aside. So we get to chapter five and part two, or sorry, part three, which focuses on the gist of natural scenes. Ooh, that's a fun word, the gist. There has been no commonly accepted definition of the content of gist. Yeah, I don't, I, that's not super surprising. Um, my understanding of the word gist is that it is a summary, a very short summary of what's happening or a short summary of something. It's interesting that she shows a term that's very not well defined, I guess. I, I find that to be a really interesting approach. So in this section, she's looking at subjects who are asked to freely recall what they were perceived in briefly displayed images of real world scenes. But it looks like uh, subjects seem able to perceive coarser level animate objects more accurate than finer levels, particularly at shorter presentation times. So you're able to get a general sense of something in an image better than specific details about that object, especially if you're shown it at a shorter amount of time. And then the second highlighted part says the same thing. That's not super surprising, but what she gets from this is basically that people can People can give the gist of a scene, whether it be an image or a video, whatever it is, better in general terms than in specifics, which kind of makes sense. This was super interesting. I, especially compared to the Andrew Ng PhD thesis, I feel like Fei Fei Li did a whole lot more. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, judge anyone's thesis because I know that the work behind it, like you don't often see the work that actually went into everything that went into these so I don't actually know how much work either of them did, but it was super interesting to see how clearly this work led to what she did as, what she's done as, as a professor and as a researcher. And I think that that's both very cool and also very unusual. It's something that you often don't find in academia. So if you wanna dig through the PhD theses of researchers like Fei Fei Li, but you need to brush up on your machine learning skills first, I would highly recommend checking out Brilliant who are kindly sponsoring today's video. Brilliant is a visually stimulating and interactive tool for STEM learning built on the principle of active problem solving. They have an ever-growing catalog of courses in math, science, and computer science that are designed to help you gain a deep understanding of STEM topics in a low-pressure environment. In fact, Brilliant has an awesome course on introduction to neural networks that will leave you ready to build a neural network or understand some of the work of the people who led the field of deep learning yourself when you finish. And if you're worried that you might not have time, don't worry. Their courses are broken down into bite-sized sections so you can learn by doing whenever you have time. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan and the first 200 people to go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Otherwise, you can check out my video on Andrew Ng's PhD thesis up here. You can follow me on my socials down here and otherwise I'll see you on the next one.